You got to change your habits or change your goals. Muay Thai is 50% running and 30% laundry. Keep working on your game. Keep innovating. I'm always winning. What is your pro tip? Switching a bit to going towards your coaching philosophy now. Um, you know, what do you think makes a great coach? I think firstly is really deeply caring. I think a lot of people coach for the wrong reasons. I think they coach for their own agenda or for their own status or for their own ego. Um, and they're not putting the player first. So I think that deeply caring about the individual that you're coaching or the group, whatever it is. Um, and then like <clears throat> really connecting with players, connecting with people on a, on a deep level is like, is crucial. If you're not making, building a connection and building a relationship with the people you're coaching or the person you're coaching, well, they're not going to buy into your messaging and they're not going to trust you. And, and so uh, to me, it's, it's those two things make a great coach. It's, it's not knowledge. It's like knowledge is a great thing to have. And that obviously is probably the icing on the cake, but, but you can be a good coach without a whole lot of knowledge. If you genuinely care about them and you connect with them and, and you get to know them and you're trying to understand their struggles and what, what they're going through, and then offer whatever advice you can or find the people or find the resources to help them in what they're struggling with. I don't know everything. So if I don't know something, I'll go and try and find it out if there's something that I can't help a player with. So they're the two pieces for me that make a great coach or a mentor. That, that makes a ton of sense. And, and who have been your biggest coaching influences and how have they impacted your performance uh, when you Look, were competing? Uh, I had a I had a really um, great sort of coach slash mentor when I was young. Um, he was a tennis coach, and he he actually taught me tennis for a few years. But then he employed me when I was young as a tennis coach. And I think without realizing, I learned a lot for, from him about how he cared about people and that the connections he built with his athletes. And and um, like I say, he didn't teach me cricket, but I, I probably learned a lot in those teenage years and and. Um, high school years about what a good coach looks like. Um, and then I've had some, some, yeah, some good coaches come and go over the years. I had a really great batting coach um, at Middlesex, Mark O'Neill. Um, but, but I probably have learned more um, from my, my mates and my met, like sort of who have been mentors as well over the last sort of probably seven or eight years or 10 years since I finished as a pro. Um, Chris Rogers is a great mate and, and mentor and someone I learn a lot from and Adam Voges as well, two of the state coaches here in Australia. Um, but yeah, like I, I think I I, I I learn a lot from podcasts. I learn a lot from books. I, I try and learn from other sports as well and, and experts who we're so lucky, like as you say, like I, or I said earlier about I, sh I share content that people consume. I consume a whole lot of content from others where we've got people – NFL or NBA coaches sharing philosophies. We've got mm -hmm. um, all these people these days are so um, generous with their knowledge and their information. You either have to pay a little bit for it or you get it for free on a podcast or a YouTube video. So, yeah, I, I think um, I, I've mentioned a few people, but I think overall it's just this never-ending sort of want to learn and understand success and high performance, um, I guess. Cool. And is there any any advice that's kind of stuck with you that you got from a coach? Um, no, not, not really. Not, not, nothing that I can recall straight away. That's sort of like a, a special moment. Um, Fair enough. I certainly, I think Mark O'Neill played a pivotal role in me getting a, a contract with Middlesex. He said to me, how are you going to get them to sign you? And I said, oh, I'm just going to keep scoring runs. And he sort of said, no. And he was the batting coach of Middlesex. Another Aussie though, he was looking out for me. He said, you need to get someone else interested so that they, can't just keep letting playing you. They have to. They have to make a decision, and so that I rang up Hampshire, and they were keen for me to come and trial. And a week later, Middlesex offered me a contract because they didn't want to lose me. So that was a pivotal moment in my career, in my life. It wasn't a piece of advice, but well, I guess it was advice. But it Fair was enough. sort of like yeah. a bit of wisdom, I guess, in like this is how you will get what you're after. And so that was a, a crucial part of my my journey, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like managing not just the on-field stuff, but advice to manage how to get what you want off the field, right? Because yeah, we're spending so you, you were spending so much time working on your game that maybe the 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 politics around uh, you know county cricket and county contracts may not have been something top of your well, mind. Well, I didn't so I didn't really get it. I was yeah, pretty young, twenty twenty one or twenty two, pretty raw, pretty like naive, didn't understand the system. So it was really 
a great thing for him to say. And, and I think he, he yeah. had my best interest at heart rather than the Middlesex's because he didn't need to right. – Middlesex didn't need to sign me if I didn't have anyone else interested. And he was contracted employed by Middlesex. So he didn't have to tell me to do that. But he was like, yeah, you do this, they'll sign you. And he was he was right. And it was I, I'm very, yeah, grateful for that. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I guess now switching towards your cricket mentoring uh, philosophy and what you've brought in, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the six pillars of success? You mentioned that. In, in the mindset book as well, um, the physical, mental, tactical, technical, emotional, and lifestyle, if I got that right. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you work on each of those with your players? Do you have modules that you run them through? Or like when you're meeting them in person, how do you go through all of those? Yeah, great, great question. Right? So this is sort of something we came up, uh, the framework during COVID when we sort of had a lot of time at home right. and, and weren't coaching as much. And it was... <clears throat> basically just looking at our, our philosophy, I guess, and what do we do? And it sort of, we gave some names to it. And um, and look, it's it's sort of saying, look, there's a technical element, there's a physical element, there's a tactical element, there's a mental. Mental and emotional are very much interconnected, but we've separated mm-hmm. them just to say to people, like you have emotions and you have thoughts. And then there's the lifestyle of your habits and behaviours and what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. So, look, um. It depends on where the player is at in their career. So it's not like everyone comes in and does this, this, and this. So um, there's some younger players who we spend a lot of time on on technical because they have to get their foundation. So the technique is the foundation of any player's game, whether it's batting or bowling or any sport. If you can't hit the ball, well, you're not going to get very far. You can't bowl the ball straight. You're not going to get very far. So we start and spend a fair bit of time on technique when they're younger and, and growing and grooving their technique. And then... We sort of have regular conversations about why did you play that shot? What like did was the field at the right sort of time to play that shot? So we we sort of have these um, ad hoc conversations around tech uh, tactical, and it's often sort of asking them questions where I'm often sharing content about <clears throat> look at the field setting here, look at what they're doing. I'm telling my players as well often. And it's not Megan being the expert, but just watch the game as a student. Listen to the commentators. Like, why is he bowling? Look at him varying his paces if you're a spin bowler. <clears throat> why is he targeting certain bowlers? Blah, blah, blah. So, and then, like, mentally we sit down and we do sort of mental skill sessions um, where we it's asking a lot of questions of them. Because um, to me, it, like, a, a player is trying to sort of learn and master or, or try and master three things. They're trying to understand and, and master the game. They're going to try and understand the game as, as a general. They're trying to master their game, their strengths and their weaknesses, what's going on in their game, but also, and probably most importantly, is themselves. What makes me nervous? When do I play at my best? Do I need to listen to loud music that fires me up? Or do I need to listen to calm music that slows me down? Do I need to sit and laugh and joke with my friends or do I need to sit off to the side and be focused? Like understanding yourself is the piece that most people miss and that's the piece that I miss. That's Mm -hmm. the bit that I didn't get. I worked hard. I knew the game really well. I studied the game. I was a captain. I knew the field settings and the tactics I was really good with. I knew my game. I tried to understand my game as much as I could, but I didn't really understand or spend any time trying to get to know me and what made me tick, what made me nervous, what made me anxious, what made me excited. Like when did I play my best? When I when was I calm and whatever. So it, it sort of depends where the players are at and what knowledge they bring. We don't just sort of have a hard and fast rule. It's often just sitting and having conversations. How are you going? What's going on? What happened on the weekend? Okay, what can we learn from that? Um, so we try and spend a bit of time um, every few weeks if needed going through that. But it, it'll often be like a 45-minute session in the nets and the first 10 minutes is talking about their my, their thoughts and emotions. They might bring in their journal and show me their thoughts, what they've reviewed or reflected, which is another thing I really encourage them to do. <clears throat> and then lifestyle is just, <clears throat> it's sort of, they've got to own that. We can't sort of go and check on what time they're going to bed or how much water they're drinking. Yeah. Or We just, we have camps and we have these sort of information sessions, you might call them, or, or sort of workshops where we're, we're encouraging the right habits and behaviours, um, but they're sort of infrequent. That's not an ongoing thing. Um, but it's often like people follow our content. We're trying to share on our, our, our page and, and in our community 
what is expected of a professional athlete. This is what Kobe Bryant expects or does. This is what Steph Curry or, or like um, Jordan Spieth or like whatever, like they're different sports, but they're high performance. So we're just trying to, <clears throat> yeah, it's trying to sort of do everything, but there's no, we're actually about to release a, a, an, an online mindset course because we get so many questions nice. about, we've, we've done our sort of ebook, which is on one small yeah. part of mindset which you've referred yeah. to, um, but we're about to launch and, and sort of publish in the next sort of six weeks a, a, an online mindset course. We did have this a course a few years ago when we, we started, um, but this will be updated. So um, that'll be available for anyone. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just trying to see where they're at. Sometimes they might walk into the nets and we talk for 45 minutes because that's what they need. They just need to talk and, and unload and I need to, give them some advice and, and ask them questions and they don't need to hit a ball because they're hitting the ball well, but their mind is playing up on them. So it's, it's often with the one-on-one -on -one clients. And then I've got players I work with online and like, yeah, it's, it, we go through a bit more of a, a structure, I guess. Um, but even that goes off on tangents, depending on where they're at sure. and what they need. It's, sure. it's sort of not a hard and fast thing. It's a, okay, well, that's where you're at. Let's, let's move in that direction. So, so I guess it's almost like um, even as a, as a coach or a mentor, it's almost like a checklist for you to see where is, you know, what's the area in these six pillars that this person needs the most assistance in at this exactly. point. Right, right now. At exactly. any time. Yeah. We're, we're very fluid human beings where our, you know, sometimes our mind will be rock solid and other times we'll be fragile emotionally or mentally. And then emotionally as well, things could be happening in life. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of awesome to realize that, okay, yeah, there are these six facets that, you know, in order for you to produce your best, they should be somewhat optimized, right? And yeah. in, in the in the right uh, frame of mind. So exactly, that's and super just useful. and just yeah, I I think that I probably ticked four of those boxes as a player when I was young. I, I my technique was okay, and I worked really hard at it. I hit a lot of balls. I loved it, as I said. I, so I worked really hard at it. Tactically, I knew the game well. Physically, I was the fittest in the Middlesex squad while I was there. I, I sort of used to pride myself on my fitness. And my habits and behaviors were pretty good. I used to go out and have a drink when I, I like, like to party and whatever. But most of the time, I was pretty disciplined. But the two pillars that I didn't know anything about was my mind and my emotions, myself. So yeah. <clears throat> it's trying to like sort of say to people, these are six things. And if you don't, if you're not fit, you're not going to make it. If you don't understand the game, you're not going to make it. If you don't understand your thoughts and emotions, you're not going to make it. You're not going to perform at your best consistently. You can have a good day here and there, but you're not going to perform your best consistently if you don't do that. You're not going to get to where you want to. So it's sort of like saying, yeah, you need to be working on yourself in all of these things and trying to optimize yourself as often as possible. Yeah, makes sense. And um, yeah, I mentioned the mindset book a couple of times now. I'll definitely put a link in the description for, for people to go see. Because I think it's, honestly, I think it's a must read for any batsman just to understand the importance of the cycle of batting and on a ball by ball basis, how to get yourself in the right frame of mind and how to manage your concentration for long periods of time. I remember coming across this article, I, I vividly remember this in like 2005, 2006 that Greg Chappell wrote, which was called The Mantra. And he talked about when he unlocked that on the ball by ball basis, he wanted to put neutral thoughts in his head and, and that allowed him to concentrate for long periods of time. What I find awesome about your four R's philosophy is that in that article, he talked about the contest, which was the, 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 the refocus phase, as you call it, when the bowler's running in and you're filling your head with neutral thoughts so you're not overly ambitious or overly negative. Uh, and then he talked about just relaxing, right? Like uh, in between balls. But there is this, um, the reflect and the reset phases that you've mentioned in the book are so key to practice as well because it's almost like, those, and, and, and uh, the specific part around having an end to each of these phases, right? And that was not something that I caught on. Even though I read that article in 2005, I would let my, you know, even the relaxation period go on for too long or the refocus period not end and, and continue concentrating really hard, right? Um, so I, I recommend people read that. And can you just talk a little bit about the four R's, I guess, before, before yeah, yeah. You better than yeah, what well, I have thank, described it as. <laughs> yeah, no, and thanks for that sort of wrap and the, the sort of promotion. I, I think it, yeah, I think there's plenty to learn and that is specific. It's called mindset, but it's specific for the contest of how to manage your thoughts in the contest. There's Mm -hmm. So much more around mental framework, et cetera, but that is specific to that. So <clears throat> it's a concept I just came up with. I was chatting a lot to Chris Rogers about this idea of 
And and in my podcast, um, I would often ask players, what do you think about when the ball is running? Because I was fascinated about where their mind is. What are they yeah. focusing on? And <clears throat> some would say nothing, and they were able to be quite sort of clear or blank. And and some would say, I give my mind a focus. I say something. So for me, I had to give my mind a focus because I would say, win this ball, win this ball, win this ball. Because right. if I didn't, my mind would wander. My mind was active. So it wanted, it wanted something to think about. So it would wander. If I didn't say, I'd be like, I'm going to hit him over here. I don't get out. Or look at the score. That's right. Yeah. So, so I sort of was talking to Chris Rogers a lot about this in-between ball. We were calling it pre-ball, post-ball, and in-between balls. And I sort of then came up with this better name of, like, of what is the process of it? And so... As you say, we sort of worked out that every ball, like cricket, is a cycle. So it's like face a ball, have 10, 15, 20 seconds off in between balls and then face another ball. And the contest, the ball only goes for like half a second or three quarters of a second or whatever, maybe a second if it's a spinner. From the time it leaves the bowler's hand to the time you hit it is a very short space of time. There's a lot more time in between. So I was thinking and very curious, how do we manage ourselves and our thoughts in that in-between time? So... I just came up with this, a lot of thinking about it. Okay, let's review or reflect. That was the first R. Then let's relax and then let's reset or refocus. <clears throat> and then, so it was three R's and then it evolved to four. And I was like, no, that like, and I got more specific. Let's reflect and then let's move on. So the first phase is like, let's learn from what's just happened. You can't just sort of chip one in the air, fall short of cover and then not try and learn that, okay, I've got to wait for it or it's a slow wicket or whatever. So you've got right. to learn. The best players are the like great problem solvers. And to be a good problem solver, you have to yeah. be thinking and understanding and like thinking about what's going on, learning. So the reflect phase is about learning. And, and you probably don't have to do that as much once you're into your innings. <clears throat> when you're in your innings and you've got all the information, you've seen the bowlers, you know the wicket, you know the conditions, you can probably not, not reflect as much. It might not be every ball, it might not be as long or whatever, but you reflect. That ends. And a lot of people don't do that. They dwell. They bring that yeah. ball forward. <clears throat> but that has to have an end point. So you learn, you move, and then you move on. That ball is done. Mm -hmm. Can't do anything more. So then you relax. And this is about managing your attention. If you're playing a 10 or 20 over game, you don't potentially need to relax either. You can. You might only face 30 balls or 60 balls at a max. So you can be on and thinking the whole time because you're only going to bat for an hour. But the brain is, a, is like a, is an, has energy and it, it's a limited resource. If we're on the whole time, we're going to get cooked. We're going to get drained. So if we're playing a longer format game and we want to bat for four or six hours, we need to be able to switch off or switch down. So the relax is about just switching down. And that's like, okay, the bowler is walking back. I don't need to be in the contest. The contest doesn't exist right now. In this moment, nothing's happening. <clears throat> so it's relaxing. It's about just yeah. letting your mind wander. Oh, there's a plane up there. Oh, there's a game going on there. What are they doing? Oh, look who's on the outfield. Like, oh, yeah. And you just, you just, mind is going wherever it wants to be. It's not, it's not got a specific focus. But again, if you're facing the bowler and your mind is just, oh, there's a plane up there. What's going on tonight? Well, you're not focused on the contest. So that has to have an end point. So the reset is where the bowler is getting close to turning or getting close to the top of their mark and you're, you're starting to walk back into the crease. So you're resetting and you're starting to look at the field again and take all the information in you. The field might have moved a little bit or whatever. So you're starting to just reset. You then reset your, your body physically. It might be getting your grip right, your feet yeah. right, your head. We say like three things max. So for me, it was always grip, feet, and then last thing was always trying to get my head in the right yeah. position. Then the bowl is running, starts to run in. And you're sort of still resetting. Like you might tap as the ball is run, starting to run in, pick your hands up, ball is running in, and then sort of head. And then in those last sort of four to six seconds, the ball is halfway in their run up or whatever for a pace bowler, you're, you're refocusing. That's where you're trying to bring all your attention to the ball and nothing but the ball and reacting to what you see. And like I say, it might be <clears throat> some players could just let their mind be and just sort of be clear. Others need to give their mind one focus. I would say win this ball, win this ball. And I'd often, when I'd get out and I'd walk off, I'd be like, oh, fuck, I wasn't focused. Yeah. Like, I was just, my mind wasn't focused. Yeah. So I like, so that's the four step process. And then the ball happens, you leave it, you hit it, whatever. You might hit it and have to run, but then it's done. The ball's finished, it's gone, that's in the past. So then you re reflect again quickly. 
oh, he's, he's got an in-swing. I've got to make sure I don't, like something for me was always my head would fall over. Oh, he's got an in-swing. I've got to just get my head down the wicket again. I'm falling over. So then I can, when I go to reset, I might re- remind myself, okay, I fell over, head down the wicket. I'm sort of tying the reflection and the reset together. The relax is its own thing and then the refocus is its own thing. So to bat, to bat sort of for six hours, you actually only need to focus like say you bat, you want to score 100, bat for six hours, a whole day in a 90 over game. You might face 200 balls. You only have to face 200 times for, 200 times for four seconds. I think Jacques right. Keller said like somewhere that like to score 100 you only in a test match, you only have to be fully focused for 14 minutes. It's not six hours. Right. It's being right. down and relaxed in the in-between moments and then sort of reflecting and learning, resetting, and then refocusing just for that small period of time. Yeah. It, it, so what I, what I also, you know, came across, having tried to practice this in my own game, um, you mentioned that it has to have a specific end, each phase has to have a specific end point. I also found it useful to have a physical connection to each phase so i think in the book um chris rogers mentions he would walk to mark on the side of the pitch which he knew that was the end of the reset phase you know for for even for me it's like okay well you need to have a physical connection to that phase that says okay now i'm done with this or i'm I'm going through it and that almost helped me ensure that i was following the process more consistently because if sometimes like in the heat of the moment someone's chirping something else is happening you might start losing your your focus so i thought that was yeah, that's kind of a, that's great a discovery that, for me. Yeah. That's awesome. A lot of when I ask people about your like their routine, they'll almost yeah. always talk about their physical routine. I'll tap. I'll yeah. do this. I'll do that. So I think it's yeah. about tying the two together. Where like David Warner pulls his gloves off in between yeah. balls and walks away, and when his gloves are undone, he's relaxing. He's not in the zone. Yeah. So it's symbolic yeah. that when he does his gloves up, he's getting back in. There's a guy I played cricket yeah. with at Middlesex, John Simpson, who's played for England. He like war as he's walking back into the crease. He like adjusts his grill, and that's like his moment yeah. to like <clears throat> come back into it. So, so I agree. Like you can sort of have like pockets on the ground, like where when I so Chris Rogers used to walk towards fine leg about four steps or six steps, and that was his time for reflection. And then he'd stand in this spot, and when he was there, that was his time to relax. And then as he'd yeah. walk back, that was his time to reset. And then as he's in his stance, finalised his stance, that's his time to narrow his thoughts and come yeah. back. So I think you're 100% right. If you can tie it in with something physical, it makes it easier. Yeah. Yeah, because you see, as you mentioned, Warner, then Steve Smith has his little intricate routine of like tapping his thigh pads and whatever. I think that's like his reset phase where he's like, okay, yeah. I'm ready to go now, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, you mentioned the refocus phase obviously being the most important in the book because, um, you know, that's when the bowler's coming in and you're about to get into the contest, right? So, you know, it's, I, I tried to follow what you mentioned as well, which is uh, I've always said, watch the ball, play straight, bat long. Like that's been the thing that I try to focus my neutral thoughts on. Um, but there are times, even as you're saying that, you're not able to get your mind actually to be quiet. So like, how do you, how do you manage that? Like the quiet, getting into that root zone of, truly being in a neutral state it's a, such a hard thing because our minds are active and we we can never know, yeah. we can never sort of control the thoughts we have what we can do is learn to focus our attention on certain things so i think a a method is is meditation or mindfulness where you can practice bringing your attention to a certain thing that the art of meditation is is not about stopping the thoughts it's about okay i can bring my attention back to my breath or I can, okay, my mind wanders, I can bring it back to something. I can bring it back to a mantra or I can bring it back to something. My mind wanders, I bring it back. And then we don't get sucked into thoughts and caught up chasing mm-hmm. thoughts and staying in thoughts. So firstly, I think it's, you can you can practice the four R's in the nets and practice the skill of going through the four and and really practice the art of like focusing that in that refocus phase. And so to do that, you've got to have someone. And so when I'm doing that with a player, I'll take 20 seconds in between balls. And so it means in a 45 sec- minute session, they might <clears throat> hit a third of the balls they would if we're on the bowling machine or, or a quarter of the balls they would if we're on the bowling machine or a tenth of the balls they would if we're doing underarms. Sure. But we're not trying to get volume. We're trying to get like really specific, quality. high quality, not quantity. So that's like one way is to actually practice it, not just try and turn it on in the game. 
But then the other way is like you can use these sort of t- techniques of like sitting down, shutting your eyes and, and becoming very aware of your thoughts. But no one masters this. I don't. I think the best players are better than others, but I don't think anyone's ever mastered the art. And like when things are going well and you're in form and you're, you're feeling good, you're scoring runs, the game can feel really easy. You're just not, you're not clouded. You're not, you're not sort of really having a lot of things going on. And people call it overthinking. But you're not thinking about your hands. You're not thinking about your average. You're not thinking about all these other things that do come into your mind. But on the flip side, when you're not going well, you're either not hitting the ball so well, so you start doubting about your technique or is something wrong, or maybe you're not scoring runs, you've started worrying about your position in the team, or your average. These are all distractions. So so then that's when, like, the game gets really confusing and you, you, the bowl is running in, but you're thinking about all these things. So you've got to be able to, like, you've got to be able to, like, have if you have this process and you practice it and you've got a mantra, so for me it was win this ball, win this ball, I wasn't thinking about my hands if I'm saying to myself, win this ball, win this ball, win this ball. So mm-hmm. I've got to just be aware. But it's, you've got to be aware of your thoughts. You've got to almost sit above your thoughts and go, okay, I, I, was, I was distracted. I'm, I'm not on and I'm still in. So then maybe you can bring yourself back and, like, you're constantly managing yourself. You can't you – no, know, you don't just yeah. master it. It's just this management. And some days it sort of happens quite easily and, and, and you're sort of in this – you're in the zone where you actually aren't thinking much, where you're just sort of – but it's a hard place to get to. Often you've got to be sort of a bit heightened and and just manage that in the moment. Switching um, gears into talking about developing career in cricket and you know how you guide um, athletes. I know uh, Teague uh, Willie is that his uh, how you pronounce w- his last name? Yeah, Wiley. He's yeah. one Wiley. Sorry, um, Teague Wiley. Uh, he's obviously you know did, had an amazing under nineteen World Cup. He's been with you. I've, I've watched his videos from a young age uh you know and they're, they're kind of moving into the stage of becoming pros themselves right so what do you what do you think is the toughest aspect of being a pro and what is it that you can share with them um oh look well i, I think i can share that i was i was where they are at some point and i, I really hope that teague and well teague already has surpassed my career but all the young players I mentor who get to be a pro, I hope that they can have a, a much longer and more successful career than I did. So I can share my experiences, but also the learnings I've had from all these other great players I, I have in my network and friendships. Um, so, but uh, the hardest thing is, is that the ups and downs, like is, is, is sort of how you can be so good one day and, 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 May and then the other next day, it's it's a it's an individual game amongst the team sort of sport. So, yeah, Teague might be Teague might like for example last year he was struggling a fair bit personally, but the team's winning. So it's sort of like managing himself amongst the group environment. Like he is desperate to do well as an individual and contribute and and feel like he belongs and is he wants to play for Australia. So he's not if he's not doing well, he's not moving towards his dreams and goals. But the team's going well, so it's managing your own individual performance amongst this this group environment. So it, that that's a challenge, and you have lots of ups, lots of downs. You might be going well, but the team's not going well. So yeah, lots of ups and downs, and it's trying to just be really level amongst that roller coaster. Got it. And then I guess you 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 made your de- debut for Middlesex in 2010. Have you noticed difference in the pathways for? cricketers to go pro uh, between the time you were attempting to do so uh, to now? Oh, look, absolutely. I think now with franchise cricket, you're not, you're no longer at the mercy of your local state or system, county or whatever it is. Like Tim David sort of was with the Scorchers, was around the WA squad and, and was released and sort of told he probably wasn't needed. And then he goes, right, I'm going to become the best number six T20 batter in the world. I'm going to smack him out the park, and that's all I'm going to practice. And he now has an amazing life, traveling the world, earning lots of money, trying to hit 10 balls yeah. and innings for six. So I think it's definitely changed. Growing up, there was no franchise cricket. The, like 2008 was the first year of the IPL. That was my first year in England. I was 20 years old. So as a 16-year-old, I wasn't aspiring to play in the IPL. It sort of happened when I was 20 and – I was never going to get into the IPL at that stage. I'd never practiced T20 cricket at that stage. Um, so now, yeah, it's completely changed. The, the sort of the money in cricket is incredible and and so many players can forge a career without having to 
sort of bat for a whole day and and bowl 25 overs so there's so many more opportunities i'm a purist i love i love the long format of the game i love test cricket it's the best format and i think the best players are, are the are test cricketers but for young players there's so many opportunities now awesome and uh what mistakes do you see aspiring cricketers making uh, that you found like a pattern in or common mistakes ah look it's such a broad question i reckon it's just everyone there's so many so many common mistakes but there are so many it's like (laughs) they they want it now everyone wants it now like everyone wants to be now and i've got to i've got to be now there's not many people a a patient realize that it's a journey and it takes time um so that's something again i try and tell them is like like okay you're not in the under 17 national team uh state team that's okay like a lot of players have gone on and done well and not been in it where you are, whereas they'll be feeling and like that that resonates with them, but they'll be feeling so disappointed and that's normal because they've been rejected or whatever. But trying to preach a bit of patience as well and realise that you can't, like this is a Chris Rogers sort of analogy, you can't take the elevator to the top. You've got to take the stairs and go just step by step by step. Um, so that's one. And, and then just sort of, yeah, trying to embrace the failure along the way, embrace that you are going to have periods where it's not going your way and it's part of the game. And it's, if you can be level through that, well, that's, that's a huge, huge sort of um, step in the right direction, I guess. Awesome. Um, I guess we'll jump now into the rapid fire round. So first thought, uh, no wrong answers. Um, who was your favorite cricketer growing up? Mark War. I love Mark War with his flick off his legs. Um, yeah, he was awesome. Yeah. And, and who's your favorite cricketer now? Oh, I think you can't go past sort of the big, like I'm a batting, I love batting. So for me, I'm, I'm quite good friends with Steve Smith. So I love seeing him do well, but Virat is incredible. I love AB de Villiers. And then I think Williamson and Root. Sure. I think those, those five are, are sort of head and shoulders for me above the rest. Makes sense. Um, did you have a favorite pregame song that you listened to? Not really, not really. I love sort of no. house, dance, party music. So anything that I was sort of vibing to at the time that would just sort of get me going, I'd, I'd sort of crank. Right. And then do you have a favourite cricket equipment brand? Uh, Grove. So growing up it was Slazenger. Mark will use it, but now we've got a partnership with Grove. Yeah. This is a local brand who nice. here in Perth we sort of have a partnership with. So, yeah, um, they, they, they make their own – well, they – go to India and they pick out their own wood for bats and they have um, really nice soft gear that they design. And yeah, so I use them for the last sort of part of my career and they're excellent. Awesome. Do you have a favorite drill? Underarms. I think underarms are nice. the best way to sort of just groove and, and grow and focus on a certain movement pattern in the technique. And in a least favorite drill? I think not not a drill, but I think the 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 thing I see a lot, not in any sort of my sessions, often with other coaches, is trying to go too far ahead, trying to put the bowling machine on too fast, and and trying mm-hmm. to challenge themselves when they're not ready. <clears throat> so yeah, a lot of people make that mistake, I reckon. And then last one, wouldn't wouldn't in in the spirit of the name of the show, do you have a pro tip for cricketers? <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, I think surround yourself with good people that will hopefully go on the journey with you throughout your career and and that will will help you become the player you're capable of being. So it could like your first and foremost parents are obviously the people's um, the number one and, and longest mentors and, and coaches often, but try and surround yourself with with mates or, or coaches or mentors that are going to help you sort of give you the feedback, give you the advice tell you the truths when you need it. Um, and then put your head down and work hard and be patient. If you're good enough, you'll make it. If you've got the right people around you and the right information and you are good enough, like I think you and I have a similar story. It sounds like where we can honestly, as, as older men now with, with family and businesses and whatever, like we can say, look, at times I was good enough, but when it counted, I wasn't because I didn't have the knowledge in my thoughts and my emotions. So I can, I can say, look, I tried my best and I was good enough on my day, but I wasn't mm-hmm. able to be consistent enough. So I think that mm-hmm. if, yeah, if you put your head down and you work hard and you've got the right people around you and you be patient, if you're good enough, you'll make it. Awesome. Um, 
I didn't. So I think that's all the questions we had. I, I did want to uh, want to share something uh, with you and the audience. I didn't want to do it at the start because I thought I might it might be a little too emotional to, before we get started. But um, you know, as I mentioned, I've followed your content for years. I reached out to you way back in July of 2020 on Instagram uh, with a, a cold DM about how we're starting Pro Tip, and you know that's um, something that I'm passionate about. Here's why I'm doing it. And I'm sure you get many messages and emails soliciting, you know, your time, right? And but what I found awesome was that you took the time to reply, and not only just reply, you there was a line that you said there, which was, "Don't ever apologize for sharing your passion and dreams with people." Because I said, "I'm, you know, I'm sorry to, uh, if this is coming at a wrong time or whatever." And for me, that was incredibly touching and motivational. And you didn't have to do that for a random stranger across the world who you may never see, never meet, never talk to, but you did. And, you know, for, for me, it's like the person we see on, on YouTube when you're dealing with your students is the person, you know, that you are. That's kind of what resonated for me. And, you know, that's why I've kind of, you know, continued bugging you to get on this uh, video and whatever. So, man, thank you so much. Uh, I, it truly means a lot uh, that you took this, this, the time and you took the time to write that message back three years ago. Um, Oh, yeah, mate. I thank you. Thanks it. for thanks for sharing that. Yeah, look, I, I appreciate. It. Apologies, it's taken so long to make this happen. But um, no, look, it's it wasn't your fault. It was on me as well. Uh, you know, we weren't necessarily in the right space at the right time. So yeah, yeah. But yeah, look, I, I unfortunately we've just ticked over one hundred and fifty thousand Instagram followers, and and we like we can't reply to all the messages anymore. But of course, I've always I've always tried, even though it might be a, a low ROI sort of um, activity, I guess. I've always tried to keep an eye on the inbox and reply to as many people as I can because they're our community. They're the people that follow our content, that that care about what we do and, and that will hopefully one day I get to meet and spend time with and, and get to work with or, or help them live their best life and, and sort of, yeah, be the mentor I wish I had, I guess. So, yeah, look, I, I haven't. There'll be people maybe listening to this and go, oh, he has never replied to my message, but... I, I try and I've, I've always tried to keep an eye on that inbox and it, it does get flooded and there are a lot of it like I'm better probably better on e Instagram than I am on email there's probably emails I've missed over the years and it just seems easier and quicker to reply on Instagram but yeah look I'm, I'm really pleased that that I was able to reply and, and that we're having this conversation and, and yeah hopefully it's inspired you a little bit so yeah thanks for having me thank you thank you so much for your time my Cheers. pleasure